here we go. All right, so today's uh, agenda, or for my sessions, the, the agenda will be to start off with a, a recap on the work that you've been doing in the bowel screen space. So for some time now, you've been looking at your PDSAs and your quality improvement activities specifically to do with, uh, with that bowel screening. And before we really kick off into talking about um, cervical screening and that program, I think it's really important that we touch base on what you've been doing, what your successes have looked like, and um, you know, what your challenges have been as well, just to ensure that we have that ongoing learning as well in the, the areas that we've already covered previously. So we'll start off with that. And then in terms of the, the QI learnings, we're going to recap those six cardinal rules of quality improvement. I'm not going to give them away now, but we'll step through those um, in, in a moment. We'll then have a look at the cervical screening uh, program, the summary of it. So the, the new screening program, what that looks like, you're going to get a lot more information about that this afternoon as well. So it's going to be just a very quick flyover to allow you to think in the space of, well, what does that mean for our practice and what can we do with that? Looking at improving participation, so obviously we're talking about uh, women's participation in, in the screening programs and how we can get better traction and improving those, those, rate, those rates of screening. Some specific strategies for um, underscreened women and what those cohorts look like. We'll have a little bit of a talk about the PENCAT uh, framework around uh, cervical screening and some of those recipes that um, will help you to get going with targeting those underscreened populations and uh, where you need to be clicking to, to get that information out of your practice software. And then we'll finish off with um, a second activity, which is around your ideas of what you would like to be doing in the space of cervical screening. And that will become a little bit clearer as we kind of step through what you need to do, what the program looks like and where those opportunities are. So the aim um, of my session for this morning is to have you step away with just some tangible ideas that you might want to take back to your practice. And it's really going to take the form of just a preliminary plan of which area do you think is most applicable to your practice and your cohort? What are the questions that you have about what's happening in your practice as a result of this? And then step through what your next action steps are going to be so that once we step away from today's workshop, you're really quite clear about the actions that you're going to undertake. So I really want to start with just recapping your successes and um, obviously I want to have a bit of a chat around the room to see what you've been doing and where things are at in terms of bowel screening. So what are the outcomes that you've achieved? What are some of the successes and what are some of the, uh, the, the challenges? So I would, um, I, I did put that on do not disturb but we're, we're all good to go now. Um, gosh, that's distracting, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't think we need to probably do too much um, formal writing down, but I'm just really keen to hear what you've been doing. So let's start over in the corner here. Thinking back on bowel screening, what are you currently active in? What are you doing in that space? What's been working well? I work in a medical practice. Okay. So I work in a healthcare service. Yep. And offer a well women's clinic, but in, in line with that, I talk in part of my consultation talk about or promote bowel screening and okay. see what they're up to. If they're 50, certainly discuss it and remind them to actually do it when yep. it comes. If they're not 50, I still bring it up and say, yep. well, when you get to 50, you mm -hmm. can yep. And it's simple to use and um, okay, great. To have all those Were you at the last workshop as well? I didn't come to this okay. Time, but I did go to. Where did I go to, Kirsten? Um, oh, it was a nurse ambassador. Yeah. Workshop with cancer, cancer. In Ballarat. That was in Ballarat. two of them last. Yeah, okay. So I, I guess the, um, the, the challenge then for you is to sort of formalise that approach and making sure that it, it doesn't just live in your head in terms of the, the clinical work that you do, but how you can turn that into a systems approach um, for the organisation as well. So that, that might be a suggestion. Well, what has she been doing? <laughs> we've been doing which we've been helping, so that all the data cleansing we think is pretty well done now. So 
with our care plans within the clinic, um, we've changed our template so that we include the bowel screen lights. Great. Before we go through our checks with our patients, you know, three to six monthly, it is a question that we ask. Yeah. Whereas sometimes that was getting lost. Yeah. And I think I can actually see, you know, we are definitely filling that out a lot more within our care plans, and we're seeing that we're doing, when we haven't got data yet to prove that, but I think we're definitely doing more bowel screening. Um, we've put the kits in all of your, um, all of the clinical rooms now, like the bowel screening kit, mm -hmm. so we can show it to patients, because I think a lot of them take it home and think they'll do it, and then they don't know what to do, they get a bit embarrassed, and then all they collect the sample incorrectly, we've had that quite a bit, and it has to be recollected. Or it's out of date. Yes, it's out of date, that's come that a few times, because they take it home and sort of think, oh, they'll do that one day. And they um, have done it, and then they get the result saying, sorry, it's out of date, we've got to do it again, and yeah. it's taking forever to do the first one. So if you yeah. can just spend that extra time going through it with them and reading through how to do it, that seems to be working um, quite So well. it sounds like you've taken a number of reasonably simple steps so this has not been like a massive undertaking but you've made some small adjustments to your processes and your systems and you're finding that it's it's able to be embedded into everyday practice and therefore has that sustainability and that's so much what this whole quality improvement um, activity is really all about to do those small things so not to think about the big picture altogether and be overwhelmed by it, but to pick those small, tangible, measurable activities that will get you going forward. Have you encountered any challenges in any of the strategies that you have implemented? Mm. I think um, the biggest challenge is probably with people thinking they don't need to do it and, it, and, and they feel confronted when you ask the question. I had a lady yesterday and she is probably past the, the actual screening. I know we say up to 74, 75, don't we? Um, but she hasn't had a bowel screen ever. And I just sort of said, and she was feeling quite confronted. I think that's the challenge. Yep. To, it's to try and make it, it's okay to do this. We're all doing it now. Yep. It's part of, um, yeah, yeah, we all need to do this. It's not, you know, it's not something so terrible. Yeah, like so some of those patient barriers that you still have to work through. Yeah, fantastic, great work. Joe, what about you guys? Um, so, Taylor and I are here today representing the uh, Spinning Clinical and Katie's just knew she didn't attend the last one, so I'll speak on behalf of you. You're off the hook. We've held our two uh, community, uh, we call them Women's Night Outs, um, and promoted bowel, breast, and cervical screening at both events. So we've got a, one of our other nursing team members is one of the uh, nurse cancer champions. And so we're looking now to implement things, we're looking at our recall reminder systems um, and data cleansing. Uh, that's kind of been in progress on a number of levels for a while, so we're just refining that. And we're also looking at ways to prompt GPs um, to be proactive and to actually have the next thing I want to do is get um, the bowel skin screening kits in each of the consulting rooms and in key patient traffic areas as well, just to be jogging. Um, and we're looking as part of it, putting our, um, we call them reasons for encounter, RFE reminders, um, to add that into our um, 45 to 49 health assessments um, and other health assessments as we go along as well. So there's a lot of work in progress, um, but we've done promotion first to get the word out, and that's been, I'd say, we're just collating evaluations, and I'd say that we've had really great feedback. From them. Terrific. And any challenges for your organisation that you can identify? As part of the workshops we held, I would agree with you that patient education um, is probably key and probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, what we actually did, it sounds a bit naff, I guess, but we actually opened up a bowel kit in front of the audience, so we had really good attendance and actually did a demonstration because I think there's... I don't think that's naff at all. I think that's really practical. Psychological barrier for people, um, and it's why 
why the kids sit in drawers in bathrooms or in bins worse, um, you know, and that actually the, 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 the people doing it doesn't happen is that there's a mental barrier there for them in many instances. Good work, excellent. Oh, PHN, PHN. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> That's why we're doing this as well, absolutely, to, to continue to sow those seeds of ideas for, um, for those previous programs. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And of course, um, the, the PHN now has a, a whole library of resources to support that work in the bowel screen area as well. If, if you're starting just that little bit further in the cycle, that um, a lot of uh, those ideas have already, um, have already been um, suggested and there are some pathways and there might be some other ideas there that um, you might like to take up. And of course, today we're going to be shifting the focus to um, cervical screening and similarly, you know, t take those ideas away and, and look to, um, to em embed those. Gabriel. <laughs> um, I am doing it backwards and haven't actually started the bowel screening stuff. I've been mainly focusing on cervical screening, but in a couple of weeks I'll start on the bowel stuff. And my main thing is just to send out recalls and reminders to people that haven't done yep. the bowel test mm -hmm. or uh, do for a colonoscopy. Great, so you've already got some fairly solid ideas about the activities that um, you do want to undertake. And as you'll find, uh, one of the key enablers to being able to undertake this work is to segregate some time. You've got to make time available in your schedule to sit down and work specifically on these items. Otherwise, you get just so caught up in the, the everyday busyness um, within the practice and you'll find that these things just kind of keep getting to the, the bottom of the list because there's always that more urgent stuff up ahead. So ensure that, that you segregate some of that time to enable you to keep thinking about these, um, these activities and, um, and programs. Great work, everyone. So let's, um, let's move on to a recap of the six rules of quality improvement. And you'll find the, uh, the resource that you were provided at the, the bowel screen session, the, the, the big kit resource, has these in there. So this is really not, not new material, the quality improvement toolkit. There we go, it's all come from there. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea to just quickly run through those. So it's the first one is systems thinking. Think about the systems and processes that you've got in place. The activities that you want to undertake, the aim is that you are able to do them again, time and time over and over so that it becomes part of everyday business rather than an ad hoc activity and a once-off um, opportunity. So think about the processes that you're wanting to trial, how reproducible that could be over the longer term. There are some activities that you might only need to undertake as, as a one-off in preparation, but when you're thinking about the longevity of how do we ensure that we don't sort of fall back on our metrics, then you need to ensure that you've got a good system in place. That system needs to be um, reliable, reproducible and consistent and of course your staff need to know about that system. So it does need some documentation to go along with it and definitely some training for the rest of your staff to, to ensure that they're on board with that. Number two, 
state your aim and anticipated benefits and do that very explicitly. So in terms of those PDSAs and these activities that you have already undertaken, you could articulate really quite clearly what it is that you had done. And that is the key to the success of this PDSA cycle, the Plan, Do, Study, Act, is that you can clearly articulate it. It's got that measure of the SMART goal. It is specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic and there is some timeline around it. When you can define all of those parameters, you're going to see a much higher likelihood that your activity is going to end up with some success and, um, and tangible outcome at the end of that. So start with the end of in, in mind. Ensure that you know what is the question that you're trying to answer with your PDSA. What is it that you're wanting to find out? Involve the team in the planning and implementation. As we know, these projects are not one person projects. You really need to involve your receptionist, your admin, definitely your GPs, and of course your nursing staff. It is a whole of practice approach in many of these areas in order to get everybody on board and moving that boat in the same direction. Um, similarly to the accreditation preparation work that you, you undertake within your practices. Gone are the days that that is a practice manager activity. It's got to be a whole of practice approach in order to get that, um, that system and process embedded into your everyday um, processes. So that's cardinal rule number two. Rule number three, make continuous small incremental changes. And that's what I really wanted to highlight with the examples that were given, that the activities were tangible, but they were not massive. It wasn't some huge program where you go, I don't know, I don't know where to start. Make sure that they are nice and small and that they are therefore achievable. Check along the way with your outcomes. So the, the notion of the PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, you plan, that's what we're going to be doing a bit more of today. You're doing, you're testing it, you're rolling it out. Um, you're then checking your progress. Did that change result in a benefit? Not all change is an improvement, but all improvements need change. So sometimes, and this is why I'm asking you, what were the challenges that you came up against? It's always really good to hear about the things that didn't work so well because you can learn so much from those, not just the bits that worked really, really well. So that's the really positive thing that you can do too, is to really focus on what didn't work so well and what do we need to change? Do we need to modify? Do we need to throw out that plan? It, it wasn't applicable, it didn't work for our circumstance and rethink, or does it just need a tweak before we roll it out further? So remember too, in terms of the PDSA, that we start with a small cohort. When you're looking at your data cleansing, you may not be able to do, um, well, you certainly wouldn't be able to do that in one day, in one go. This is going to be an incremental activity. So define a period or a cohort that you say, I can see the start and I can see the end. It is contained and it is um, it is measurable and so we can, we can work with that, come to the end and then assess, did that work okay before we move on to the next lot and the next stage? You may have wanted to do some tweaking along the way in terms of your process or your, your approach about it. You may have found other impacts that you hadn't uh, foreseen that are meaningful in, in this context, you've got to take all of that into account. So it's, um, th there's a lot of considerations in that review activity and knowing where, where you need to tweak. And as we said before in the last session, a lot of this work in terms of the PDSAs, we're talking about it in rather formal ways now, the way it happens in reality uh, within your practice probably feels a whole lot more fluid. You're doing PDSAs all the time. You're doing this as part of your normal operational roles. This is just getting you to think about it in that slightly more formal way to be more determined about what is it that we're going to do? Does that make sense? 
and how do we evaluate that so that we know that the change has been an improvement. Continuous small incremental changes is good. Don't eat that elephant in one go. Take it one bite at a time. Big changes are difficult. Small steps. Check your outcomes along the way. Keep score, measure progress. This is super duper important too. So as part of your planning activity, you need to set your measures of success. How will you know that the activity that you're undertaking will have achieved the intended outcomes? So you need to define your success measures pretty much from the outset. And again, they don't need to be terribly difficult. So if you're thinking, for example, for data cleansing for a cohort of patients, the outcome will be that your data measures have improved by whatever percentage or factor that you have determined over what period of time. So those outcome measures, again, don't need to be terribly complex, but you do need to know what's going to tell you when you've come to the end of that. Keep score, measure progress, it's important. Define your measures and use your data. I like this one, number five, still shamelessly. Network with each other, learn from each other's successes and failures and pay it forward. So when you find that something's working particularly well, sing about it. Make sure that others can learn from your experiences because there's no benefit in everybody having to reinvent the wheel and that's why still shamelessly is really, really important that if it's worked for another practice, chances are it's a good process, it's a good methodology. Adapt it, use it, and don't think that you need to start from ground zero and dream it up yourself. And hopefully from today too, you'll get lots of ideas. And the idea is that you use those ideas and, and run with them and make something of them. Um, but you know, in terms too of resources, if you find that you've developed um, a template that's working particularly well, if you're saying we've now amended our um, GPMP or TCA templates to routinely ask that question, what's that looking like on the ground? Show it to others, share it through Basecamp, um, through Kirsten, to ensure that others can kind of go, oh yeah, that's a simple one too, I can do that, and it has big impacts, big outcomes. So, so certainly do that. The falling forward culture is pretty much about that growth mindset and the expectation that not everything is always going to end in success, but that the embracing of change and the trying of methodology and embracing change is the mindset that everybody within the practice accepts. So it is an openness to new ideas, innovation, and doing things just that little bit differently. So that is such a key component too of this, um, this the, the cardinal rules of quality improvement that that has to be embedded into the culture of the practice. And that's easier said than done. That can take a really long time for practices that are already in that space, the challenge is to maintain it and to nurture it. And for practices that aren't quite there yet, you need to do that groundwork to have those conversations about why that approach and that readiness to test and to change and to, uh, to modify your practices so that we get better patient outcomes at, uh, at the outset that that's really what that's all about. But that, like I said, that's harder to achieve than what it is to say. And um, I guess on, on virtue of you guys all being here, you kind of get what we're talking about here, but that doesn't always necessarily translate um, across the broader team. And that's definitely a challenge. You might also want to think about that particular aspect more globally about a PDSA activity that you might want to undertake within your practice to really look at how you better engage your whole team in that, uh, that, that change thinking within the practice and the readiness uh, for, for which they are or are not to play in that space. One of the great ways that you can look at that as well 
is um, to perhaps introduce that as a regular agenda item for your staff meetings. So have quality improvement as a regular recurring theme within your team meetings so that you can keep having those conversations about where are we at and what can we be, um, be doing better. The six cardinal rules, that was those. So I want to quickly run you through now the cervical screening program, that's changed a little bit. You're going to be uh, learning a lot more about that this afternoon. So this is not a deep dive, this is just a, a gloss over what the new program looks like. So you'll be aware, no doubt, that in uh, times gone past, the cervical screening program was a uh, recommended two yearly uh, screening program for women without symptoms and uh, with, with negative uh, return screens. Every two years, that was the recommended program. And you'll know now that uh, that's been replaced by, uh, so rather than looking at, uh, at, at the cells, so the, the previous program was a cytology exercise. So a uh, bit of a scrape onto the slide and the cytologist screeners at the pathology laboratory were actually looking for the cellular changes uh, within uh, within the, the, the smear test to tell you where or to you know to give an indication of whether everything is okay or not and that's now changed to direct testing for the HPV virus the human papilloma virus so uh, the, the way that that's done means that this only needs to be undertaken every five years because of the sensitivity and the specificity of that particular testing, which is, yay, that's a good thing. Uh, but that's the, the big change that's been undertaken. The uh, age range has now changed as well. So it used to be that the recommended um, age for, for screening started at 18. That's now um, increased to uh, to 25 years of age, uh, where the first screening needs to be um, undertaken. Uh, so, so the accuracy is definitely improved with the HPV test. The time interval between, um, between testing has changed from two to five years, and the age has now increased. The age range, um, People aged 70 to 74 years will be invited to have a cervical um, screening test done as well. So again, that might be something that you think about, well, how, how do you work that when the previous recommendations sort of really um, stopped well, um, well before that, uh, you know, at that 69 year step. So that's the big change that's happened, but of course we know that in the, old, uh, in the old system, and perhaps now with the newer system too, that underscreening is still a huge problem, and that's the space that we're going to be working in and that you're going to be challenged to think about how we can improve all of that. Is everybody reasonably familiar with the, the changes to, to the program? Okay. So we're now really looking at improving patient participation. How do we encourage women to undertake this testing. What are the issues there? So there is a, a self-collection methodology available and I will put up my hand to say I actually know nothing about what self-collection is going to look like, but I hope that uh, this afternoon uh, there'll be information about that. You're, you're, you're more familiar with that? Would you like to explain? Um, yes, I have I don't know anyone that's actually done it, but there are parameters around it. Right. It's not, I don't want to go and have my cervical screen, I want to do it, because everyone asks that question. Yeah. Haven't they found a way that we can just do it ourselves in the privacy of our own bathroom? Um, the self collection method is for women that are four years overdue. Yes. Think, yep. And, and or other issues. Yeah, well, that's true. I guess what I was asking more about is, what does that look like? What is it that we are asking of women in terms of self-collection? Is there a similarity between, you know, what a traditional pap smear um, involved? It's really the same. No, it's just a swab. Just a swab. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, well, there you go. Right. Okay, excellent. Over the age of 30. Yes. Being more than four years. Yeah. 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 
the a squat, um, has to know the bathrooms, but still needs to be um, taken to pathology. Yes, like definitely and still needs testing. Abnormal, then the woman still needs to have a speculum inserted to complete the test. Right, so okay. The main, that's the main thing. The yeah. self-collection, okay, we'll blow off for that one. Mm -hmm. But if it comes back um, positive, <coughs> They still have to have the, the real deal. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then at least that doorway has been open to, you know, to... Um, of course they do, yeah. And then that's, that's the challenge too, isn't it? So that's the uh, self-collection is, uh, is one methodology that you can use for that, that better uh, patient participation. Disability access, so think about to the, the patient cohort that we are talking about and, and we, will, we will delve into this just a, a little bit further, but what is access like and do we think about accessibility for, uh, for women with, with disabilities? How are we physically able to assist women to undertake these procedures? when uh, perhaps they might be wheelchair bound or have other, um, other mobility issues. How do we facilitate the ease with which they can get tested and feel comfortable in doing that? So that's actually, it's a big question and you need to think about who are your patient cohorts and uh, the, the physicality of your practice and how that either is a barrier or um, an enabler for making this just that little bit easier. So networking with uh, women's health centres. So I guess this is, uh, this is really saying uh, communicate and collaborate with those who play in this space very extensively because they will have other ideas and perhaps you know, marketing resources and approaches that could be, uh, could be applicable or it could be about a pathway for referral if patients are saying, uh, I just, I don't want to undertake this here, have a second option available uh, where women can be referred to other services for, um, for these tests as well. So again, it might be about having a conversation with your GPs and your nurses to say, well, who else plays in this space? And is this what we do when we're sensing resistance? Is this part of what we put on the table to help enable uh, that better screening to take place? Community-based com uh, promotion campaigns. So obviously a little bit of that's been done with the bowel screen program as well, but think about what you might be able to do with your community in terms of raising awareness and um, you know, promoting, uh, promoting activities. Of course, along with the change to the new HPV testing process, there has been a fair bit of, um, of marketing from the, the federal departments to encourage you know, uptake of that. That will probably you know, start waning a bit and the question is, well, going, going forward, how do we sort of maintain yeah. that? One of the, the questions that I would have is now that we're on a five-yearly uh, program, how easy is this to kind of fall off the radar for women altogether? That you know, the interval is now much, much uh, longer and it, it's no longer quite so front and centre of mind where you know, every two years you... You know, you, you'll be going, okay, it's, it's time again, and now five years, that's a really long period of time. So there is absolutely that opportunity for the underscreening to actually increase rather than decrease. So think about, about strategies that you might put in place for that too. Uh, web social media posting, so think about what your presence is looking like in terms of your, your website, whether you can put out some blog postings or you know, some Facebook posts. To, um, to encourage this. The interactivity too with community social media pages on behalf of your organisation, maybe that's another opportunity to get a broader audience and it wouldn't be targeted just for your patients but as really that community activity that you might want to look at um, undertaking. Posters, uh, waiting room videos, direct marketing, think about whether you can send SMSs to your patients once you've gone through and you've identified those underscreened women or those who might be due. What is your process that you might want to put in place to, to get that happening nicely? In terms of direct marketing and certainly SMSs, just remember that you only have uh, limited characters in SMS messaging which can make it very difficult to tell the story that you want associated with this to encourage them to come in. So often SMSs can be quite 
direct because you haven't got the characters to be able to, to put a nicer story around that. So that's, again, one of the things that you might want to um, have a think about. In Um, well, I think it depends on, it, it de yeah, with a lot of the web links you can shorten them so you can, you can get the shortened web links so uh, that's worthwhile to think about whether, um, you know, any links to, to websites, whether you can convert that into a, into a, a shorter string to, to moderate that. So that's, you know, one of the, I certainly hadn't even considered any of that prior to just standing here and having a talk to you, but that's the kind of thing that you want to be thinking about. Well, what, you know, what are the barriers and what can we do with that? So, yeah, that, that's really good. Uh, waiting room videos, I've got one here and I hope. This can take more than 10 years. The new test is more effective at detecting women at risk of developing cervical cancer by detecting HPV. Even if you have had the HPV vaccine, you'll need cervical screening because the vaccine does not protect you from all the types of HPV that cause cervical cancer. If you have HPV, your sample will be examined again to look for abnormal cells and your healthcare professional will discuss the results and next steps with you. The way your sample is collected by your healthcare professional won't change. Women who have not screened regularly may be eligible for an alternative way to collect a sample. So ask your healthcare professional at your next appointment if this is an option for you. If you don't have HPV, you'll only need to have this test every five years because you are at low risk of developing cervical cancer before your next test. The National Cancer Screening Register will invite you to have a cervical screening test when you are next due. So, if you're aged between 25 and 74 years of age, ask your healthcare professional about the new cervical screening test. It could save your life. So that's, um, that's a good little, little video to, um, to perhaps put up within your, um, your waiting room. It would also be a terrific link. So if you're going to do any sort of social media posting, just link it to this video. It's, it's about two and a half minutes long. You can see it, it kind of goes into much more of that explainer in very friendly terms, in layman's terms. The language uh, around that is, is simple. Those resources are kind of ready to use for you guys. So, uh, you know, make use of it. Uh, look them up and um, incorporate them into the activities that you're, um, you're going to be undertaking. There are, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is, there, there's heaps out there. Sort of thinking back a couple of steps, just promotion, when it comes through on your Instagram or you see and if you share it, well then that goes out to a wider Very much so, yeah, yeah. It could go viral. <laughs> That's the idea too. That. Yeah, yeah. A lot of women think that they, they were in the pap screen system. Yep. That's my thinking yep. anyway, because there has been a little bit of a dip in my service that, oh, well, I'm not due, I might be due according to the two years, but actually there's a new, that new test is in, so I don't need to go for five years. So I've sent out a blurb in their reminder that actually you need to jump on board with the new test to get into the five years. Yes, that's exactly right. No, no. That's yep. That's exactly right. That messaging it takes a long time to um, to filter out. So uh, just a few strategies, especially for that underscreened uh, cohort that just can be so difficult to uh, to engage with. So some education sessions uh, specifically to address uh, fears. So uh, you know whether you can do some some focus group activities or uh, go out to community groups and give some presentations and have a talk about what is involved there. Part of that, um, uh, the, the, the fear, addressing the fears, you might actually want to start at the younger cohort. So think about engaging with some schools and getting that education out there before uh, young females are actually due to take 
to take that anxiety away before they've had to embark on this and to really put them in the frame of mind that this is important um, and it is, it is nothing to be, uh, to be fearful of and to be able to explain through what the process looks like, what it feels like and um, you know, what they might expect when, when they undertake this. Think about your um, culturally and language diverse communities within your practice population and what specific needs they might have in terms of communication. You may need to have some resources in languages obviously other than, than English or think about some of those cultural barriers that might be inherent. So in terms of the, the approach that you have or even the, uh, the staff that you employ and that you work with, is there anything that you can do to reduce those barriers and make it more acceptable for, um, for, for those women to engage in this program? For the, uh, for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population, it is the cultural appropriateness of the service that is really important. And by that we really mean that they really appreciate their health practitioners to um, have that same cultural background or just be very cognizant of what that culture is all about and be able to speak to the, the patient base in a way that is meaningful to them. So that certainly wouldn't be um, only in this particular screening program, that really goes for health services across the board of course. Um, and regular invitations. So this is, you know, some of the research has been done that what will help them is to get frequent uh, prompting of that, that just a, a single invitation and saying you're going to get one invite and that's all you're going to get. That might not work for that particular uh, patient cohort. So you may need to think about multiple strategies for trying to engage them to, to come into this. For the um, LGBTQI community too, just the uh, holistic services uh, in, in, and inclusion of that, perhaps in the most part, it wouldn't sit terribly differently for, uh, than for the, the, the general female population. But I would really encourage you to think especially of um, trans people um, who, um, who, who have female reproductive organs, they need to be tested even if, of course, they don't identify as female as such. This is a really important cohort that you need to be thinking of. And certainly from a GP and nursing perspective, it can be easier to forget about those important health screening um, activities when the presentation is, uh, is slightly different. So challenge your health workers to think about those contexts in terms of the service offerings as well. Uh, put in there, just think about uh, the Rainbow Tick accreditation framework um, and that will certainly talk you through the mindset and, and the thinking that is required in effectively dealing with the LGBTQI um, community. Joe, I know that you guys are really active in this space. Have, have you got some further feedback on that? Um, no, we're, we're looking at Rainbow Tick, um, but we look to build a foundation that heads of that would develop an inclusivity and diversity policy to be a foundation and introduction so that we incorporate things like core community, ATSI community, LGBTIQ community as well, um, and disability. Um, you know, we're kind of looking at the whole range of yep. factors to increase our awareness, sensitivity in the way we practice. Uh, so that's just in progress now. We're looking at Rainbow Kit. We're, we're looking for whether you know we will need that, or but there's certainly good learning from that process. I think that's a really great point. Um, if you're not terribly familiar with the Rainbow Tick accreditation framework, it is very meaty. There is a lot to it and it is quite a robust um, accreditation framework that in my estimation, most general practices would really struggle um, to achieve. But that's not to say that you can't download the standards that apply to that, to, to that accreditation framework and take out of that the elements that you could possibly incorporate into your practice without going the whole hog of, of getting that rainbow tick, but thinking about 
how do we uh, deliver our services that is really respectful and appropriate uh, for that patient cohort. So perhaps you know, another learning out of today's session is, is perhaps to look a little bit broader beyond the RECGP standards in terms of quality improvement and what that means for a broader cohort of patients than what you might traditionally uh, be thinking about. Um, so in terms of uh, trauma patients, just the, uh, the suggestion to offer self-insertion for a speculum or look at uh, self-collection methods. In terms of bring a friend, I don't know about that. I'm not sure that that would necessarily encourage someone to, um, to, to do that. Joe, um, I've got a screening nurse background and I think it's vastly underestimated the importance of the nurse as I think it's unrecognised um, across the board in our community. And so I think that um, some offering um, for someone to bring a friend can actually be stressful. It happens rarely, but to offer it is a huge problem yeah. for people who know they can have someone there that's their advocate. Great point. Um, yeah, so um, if, if there's not, if, even if they feel they can't do that, you can offer mm -hmm. another nurse or assistant in the process. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What you might think about too in terms of the prevalence of uh, trauma is introducing that aspect of a barrier into all of your um, promotional material as well, recognising that this could present uh, some real challenges for a lot of women and some strategies uh, to, to come around that. So maybe maybe look at incorporating that in all of your messaging. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, of course, you do need to make sure that if you're going to go down that pathway, that what you offer actually is what you are selling. That's going to be hugely important. So don't underestimate the work that you may need to do to ensure that everybody um, is thinking in that space and, and along the same lines. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you have? Um, yeah. I've, just, I've got a resource in your packs. It's a resource that um, Cancer Council Victoria did in Casa a few years ago now, but it's looking at sexual assault and, and just ways of supporting women during that process. Okay. So yeah, terrific. Good stuff. Yeah. And we, we spoke, sorry? I was going to say it's incredible if you've done phone calls to women for recall reminders for overdue. Um, it, you know, when you gently question, uh, what the barrier is for them attending, how frequently they'll say, Joe, I've been sexually assaulted yeah. at that stage and I choose not to screen. And then it's offering them alternatives yes. that can help them to be empowered yeah. to come yeah. along. So yeah, exactly. I think the guidelines are in some ways not supporting what we're doing. Um, I have an incident where I had a lady that I wouldn't say had an intellectual disability, but I'd say just coming from poor in a um, social background, who was blind, technically blind, um, but could see some things. And it took me a lot of, with that head made, a lot of um, consultations to get her up to the stage of even contemplating. And then we got to the stage where. Um, so we could do a self-collect. She definitely did not want an examination. We got right to the stage where I was trying to show her on the um, swab what she had to do and everything. And she said, I can't do this. Will you do it for me? And I said, yes, I would. So I documented that on the um, pathology request. And I got a reply that they wouldn't accept it. Oh, God. 
gosh. That is just devastating. A lot of talking, a lot of discussion. In the end, they said, if you don't have to begin to start to ask us all the questions. Yeah. Just to sell their rent to make themselves clear. Gosh, that's, yep. Yep. See, this is, you know, sometimes where rules and regulations get in the way of actually providing exemplary care. Yeah, Yes. Yep. 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 Exactly. We've spoken about um, disability too in terms of um, providing additional appointment time um, and providing further assistance to make that as, as easy as possible. The things that make screening a little bit easier or more acceptable is um, access to a female GP um, and or a, a, a practice nurse. The ability for women to find the service and to attend. Using the interpreter services if required. So obviously um, that, you know, uh, that language barrier, there needs to be sufficient explanation around that for it to be acceptable. The impact of a GP recommending that this be done is one of those major enablers. So the GPs actually need to have those conversations with patients, with clients, when they're in front of them for whatever reason. And that can be difficult when doctors are limited in the amount of time that they've got. But if a GP indicates to a patient that this is an important activity to undertake, an important screening activity to undertake, patients are more likely to uh, find that acceptable rather than having to dream that up themselves and self-refer. So that prompting, just like it is with many other health areas, the GP's uh, input and impact is, is really quite significant. The um, reminders and opportunistic prompts, so think about top bar and we'll talk a, li a little bit more about that as well. Uh, there are some, uh, some things that you can do there to set reminders and recalls so that if you are using things like Top Bar, that there will be a prompt that comes up to remind the GP it's time to talk to you about having your screening as well, so that can help. And providing information, resources, and having the time and the space to have those conversations. And it sounds like that is what you guys are all really, really good at to say stop. Let's have that conversation. Let's draw that out a little bit further so that we can get to the next stage. And you know, time is the enemy of, of everyone, I guess. So um, I think that's really, uh, really exemplary. And it just, it just shows so clearly why nurses are so valuable too. They can provide that time and the slower pace to work through those issues um, a bit more effectively. So we'll quickly uh, run through, and I think we're starting to run a little bit out of time. The uh, PENCAT and um, cervical screening, I probably won't spend too much time on that. There are um, recipes available within the, the toolkit that will talk you through how, um, how you can identify patients who are eligible um, or under screened. So it's looking um, in, in that screening section for the cervical screening, select your parameters and a number of them have been listed there. You can choose one or a number of them, export those patient lists and then if you've got that linked to top bar, you can create uh, that direct link in the daily view com um, component of, um, of PENCAT to uh, draw that patient list out and globally set those reminders uh, for that automatic notification. So I think that's, that's really good. Are you all using top bar within your practices? No? Yes? No? Um, Re reason why? Well, no. Not compatible. Yeah. Okay. So there are technological barriers always, of course. And also, um, Linda will be going through this this afternoon. Yep. Okay. Terrific. Fine. Yep. Okay. So there is also uh, the 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 opportunity to. Um, identify the cohort who might be eligible for the self-collection as well. So I won't go through, um, through that as well. In terms of um, your ideas, what I want you to do is just to spend a couple of minutes 
identifying what your next step is going to be. So as a result of some of these ideas that we've talked about in these, um, in these domains, have a think about what your plan might look like. So maybe five minutes and then we'll get you to quickly uh, tell the room about what you might be doing with this. So whether it is about creating resources, a marketing campaign, um, an, an awareness, um, awareness campaign, upskilling your team or any other activity, just jot down some notes on what your plan might be. So this is the P of the PDSA where you're planning your activity. So think about your activity and think about your success measures and perhaps a little bit of a timeline along with that as well. So that's a little bit of accountability for you. So just a couple of minutes to jot down your thoughts. We might, um, we might just reconvene. Who wants to start us off with, um, with their QI ideas and their PDSA for cervical screening? Who wants to go first? All right, I'm coming a little bit closer so that we're picking up the sound so uh, a little bit better. Just as we've been talking, I've just written so, a lot of ideas. So um, we're working on the Women's Health Week Information Night and my lovely colleague here, Amanda, is going to be our guest speaker because she's done some incredible work overseas yep. with uh, women's health and survival screening. So that's a bit more health education. Um, we're looking at uh, reminders and trying to do something by SMS or using different apps on phones. That's a big thing that yeah. we're trying to work on, but it's probably bigger than what it is. Um, so chunk it down. Just, chunk it you know, down, chunk yeah. it down. Yeah. So we, we realise that we have to do yeah, this, getting the other we, things. We really want to send SMSs out, text mm -hmm. messages, but it, our, our um, software isn't that user-friendly to do that. So we're looking at that to try and make it happen. Okay, excellent. Um, at, which might reduce a lot of our time doing Okay, so the challenge then is to just identify what is it that you need to do next? What is the activity that you need to do next to progress along that? Mm -hmm. So it might be talk to SMS providers mm -hmm. about how we can get this system up and running and look at some cost plans for that. That could be your number one activity. Then you're very clear that you've got to pick up the phone and speak to someone. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by chunking it down to say you've got a bigger aim, but you need to just chunk it down into bite-sized pieces to ensure that you're clear about what is the step, what is the activity I need to undertake to help to achieve that, uh, that ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So. The less clearly you, you are about that next step, the more likely it is that it gets to that stage of inertia and you go, yeah, we were going to do something about that. Yes. We haven't quite gotten there. But by saying, I'm going to ring these three providers in the next two weeks, you're really clear about your activity and what you're going to do. And your measure of that will be that you've actually rung them and you've got some costings and then you can move on to the next step. So it sounds, um, it sounds like a no brainer in, in a way it is, but it is just about not keeping your goals too lofty because you can get lost in the detail and it's too easy to go, oh, I didn't quite get around to it. Uh, so keep, keep, it, keep it small and chunked. Anything else to, to add here or? Um, what else did we say? Um, uh, well, we already run clinics, uh, late clinics, but I think we used to just do them once a term. So we're trying this year to do them two monthly um, instead of every three months. Yep. And thinking about um, a Saturday, yep. offering a Saturday morning clinic yep. as well. Yep. Um, what else? And signage on computers, like a little reminder. To yep. We did trial that probably a year ago. So but it's time to upgrade that, yeah. I think, and put yeah. a new look on it. Yeah. So it's a reminder to all yeah. clinicians, please ask your patient if they're yeah. for their spot screen or perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great work. Thank you for that. Um, so we Taylor, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take the stage. Good on you. <laughs> we kind of had the similar thing like the recalls and the SMSs and that. Um, we also thought about putting like an article in like the local paper to like um, advertise the change <coughs> for the um, screening and the um, tests and whatnot. Um, yeah, might like running yeah, ads on your TV in the waiting rooms. And yep. Sort of, yeah. Good stuff. And how soon are you going to be doing that? Our recall works 
in progress, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't take too much. It's then coordinating across the practice around yep. that agreement around the SMS reminder. Yes. Um, that's, we're on the cusp of, um, so we're almost there yeah. really, so it really progressing forward yep. that we're already in train. Um, the TV promotion is being revised as we speak, yep. so um, I feel like we're kind of well on the path. Terrific. Yeah. And of course you'll know that for the next workshop in Ararat we will start off with uh, just a, a recap on what did you do and what did you find. So, you know, we will be, we will be asking yeah. about how it's all going. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, what about you? Uh, so my uh, plan is sort of, I think, 12 to 18 months. Hopefully that's realistic, but just reskilling um, my my women's health. So getting back into doing pap screening, I took a break to have my twins. So just getting back into that, and I got my endorsement this year. So I want to add, you know, that into my women's health as well. And I've been accepted by family planning to do my IUD insertion and removal, and I'll do the implant on as well. So just incorporating that into a well women's clinic and maybe some outreach as well to underserviced areas. That's the long-term plan. Fantastic. So, so again, same sort of um, recommendation to just keep chunking it down. You've got a, a wonderful longer-term goal that you would like to achieve, and it's going to be um, it's going to involve a number of steps along the way. So identify those steps um, and and keep working on them. But yeah, that that will be uh, that will be terrific. Gabriel. Um, I am teaming up with a couple of other nurses and one of the doctors to run um, a promotion during Women's Health Week. So what we're going to do is get a table with all information about women's health and we'll also be hopefully running um, just like short clinics for people to just come get pap smears with one of the female doctors and one of our nurses. Is when, is when, when is Women's Health Week? Um, the 2nd to the 6th of September. Okay, all right. And how will you um, develop some of those those programs into more sustainable, longer term um, offerings? Is that part of the plan, or not quite at this stage? No, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be really keen to hear at the next workshop. You know what uh, what you've been able to achieve and and the impact that that had. You might also want to think about what will be the measures of success of that uh, very focused activity as well. So how will you evaluate that activity and the impact that that has? And that's a, it's an easy question to ask and it's probably much harder to define that, but just have a think about whether you can put any measures in place that tell you that the way you've gone about that has been successful or perhaps for the next time around you might uh, rejig or, or tweak. So just, just think, think about those aspects um, of it as well. All right, so we've got some, uh, some great ideas happening here. It is coffee time.